Hey guys, how are we doing? Doing well. Good. Great. Excellent. Well, it's Thanks a real pleasure to have you on this stage. Um, so we're here to discuss the, you know, the real power of NFTs um, and how, no, how the real power of NFTs enable new business models for the streaming TV um, and movie industry and how NFTs have the real potential to give content creators and audiences a better way to stream and experience content and connect with the shows and brands they love in a more experiential way. Um, but before we dive into the questions that I've got for you guys, I believe we have a VT to run. So if you could play that. In entertainment, it's rare when a visionary comes along. Someone who sees around the corner, recognizes trends, and capitalizes on them. That person is Ryan Kavanaugh. Named the Billion Dollar Producer and Showman of the Year by Variety and one of the most influential 100 people in the world by Vanity Fair, Kavanaugh has not only overseen the financing, producing, and distribution of more than 250 feature films and some of the most successful television programs over the last 15 years, but has created a paradigm shift for the entire entertainment business. We realized that our film properties could be more than just profitable movies, but in fact, they are perhaps the greatest TV pilots ever known. He has pioneered sophisticated slate and co-financing models that provided over $25 billion of capital to major studios, including Warner Brothers, Universal, and Sony, and helped pioneer a new revenue window with Netflix called SVOD, changing the entire film business as we know it. It's not a coincidence. A brilliant VT then, really setting up what it is we're here to talk about. Yes, I think that deserves a round of applause too. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the emergence of blockchain technology has provided a new opportunity, a real opportunity for the entertainment industry to improve and redefine itself. So my first question, guys, is how can ownership, rights management and royalties be enforced on a blockchain? And I'm anyone can dive I'm happy in. To jump in. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a good question. I think part of the problem we have today, in speaking from Hollywood perspective, is that Hollywood is always... Hollywood lives between fear and greed. They never want to go first, but they never want to miss out. So there's this whole combination where blockchain and crypto and NFTs all get mixed together in the same bucket, and then one thing goes wrong and Hollywood goes running. But they'll always be second. So the, the, the second someone goes first, They'll, go, they'll copy, which is exactly what happened when I did my deal with Netflix in 2010. Like all the press was like, oh, he's crazy, what's Netflix? It's a shitty little mail order DVD company. And then by 2014, every studio had to deal with them. So I think what's happening right now is that quietly, the theater chains, the pay-per-view companies, um, companies such as Rad, um, and the tech-based companies, without using the word crypto, without using the word NFT, have transitioned already to blockchain. So most people don't realize you know, that most of this stuff is already running on blockchain because it's more efficient. They just don't, meant, they don't use those words. What will ultimately happen, my belief, is the most inefficient part of Hollywood is the accounting, um, the royalties and the residuals. So it's how actors get paid, how writers get paid, how producers get paid. Um, there's probably 300 people in what we call the waterfall of a movie, TV show, or any kind of entertainment. And today, the only single way, the way it works with, it, with a major studio is, I have a contract that says I'm entitled to X. I can't audit for two years. So if the studio says, oh, that movie didn't make any money, you don't get paid, I have to wait two years. Then there's two auditors to pick from, and they always have their 10 big guys that go first, like a Spielberg or a, you know, a Geffen. And then in maybe four years, I can audit, and then they offer me some settlement. Mm -hmm. Once blockchain is put in there, people realize in real time, you can know exactly what you, you're supposed to make. There's absolutely no middlemen. There's no room for fudging. And it's literally like as a transaction comes in, I see it and it can hit my account. What I believe will happen is the guilds and the unions who drive everything will end up mandating that. And whoever creates that is going to own, you know, a $200 billion a year industry. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think from a platform perspective, that's it's basically, you know, kind of what Ryan was saying is abstracting a lot of that complexity away 
from people and making it really easy to go in and say, here's a title, here's the description, here's all the people that should be getting paid in a really simple web interface, hit publish, that smart contract gets pushed on chain and it's transparent, everybody can see it, they can audit it and when you push money into it, all the people get paid appropriately. Mm -hmm. So taking that, that complexity, which we, we understand, but you know, if you, as soon as you start to say the words NFT and crypto and blockchain to anybody in the, yeah. Yeah, they're just, their eyes glaze over, they don't, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, I think our job as like platform creators is to make it simple and easy and clean and make it feel like any other platform that they're already using. And then yeah. behind the scenes, like actually use the power that comes with blockchain in terms yes, of you know, yes. transparency and immediacy. I can yeah. see you nodding there. I feel like you've got something to add. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, he's my business partner, so just <laughs> basically answered that question. But I think a lot of these technologies, to echo what both Ryan and Tony said, um, don't necessarily have to have be shoving them down people's throat like uh, a lot of the industry does. Um, they'll work kind of seamlessly in the back end and our job with our platform and what we're creating is to, to make it easy for people to use those technologies mm -hmm. without even necessarily having to you know, dig in the weeds and um, in the consumer uh, case, really even realizing that they're using it. Yeah, yeah. I think what's great is, you know, we finally have this technology of the potential to really transform the way that communities interact and participate in this economy, you know, by empowering creators, fostering collaborations, innovations, and ultimately building a more equitable um, economy. And that's really what, what's quite important as well. Um, noticing the time, so I'm going to dive straight into my next question. How and why will content creators earn more with NFT ownership models than the current traditional model? You want me to... Fewer yeah. middlemen. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> this fewer middlemen. <laughs> how is it going to change? Is that the, the question? How do they earn more? Yeah. How? Oh. Well, right now the problem is NFTs in Hollywood are a very bad word. And that, that's really set because, unfortunately, an NFT can be anything. Mm -hmm. And it can be a lot of value or it can be no value. So there became the NFT craze where everybody in the world that had any kind of you know, fame or ability to publicize themselves just stuck their name on something called an NFT and sold it. And so there's a lot of people that feel very burned, um, a lot like, I'd say more so than crypto. But at the end of the day, if you remove the word NFT for a minute and you just talk yeah. about a, a digital collectible, right, which is really what an NFT is supposed to be, mm -hmm. um, there, it, what's, it's already happening all day long. It's Roblox. It's, um, yeah. it's Fortnite. It's what our, our kids, who are, you know, my seven-year-old is just starting to do it, but, you know, all the way up to 20, they're already doing it. I mean, my son, when he asks me for, you know, allowance, he doesn't want an allowance in cash. He wants it in Roblox so he can buy a new suit <laughs> for his character or he can get a bigger gun or a bigger car, you know, and that generation is becoming teenagers, mm -hmm. they are becoming teenagers. And those teenagers will start having more spending power. And when they're in their young 20s, that's what they'll know. To them, digital collectibles are just as important as physical collectibles. Yes. We, you know, in our generation and, and the generation above and directly below us, didn't really grow up with that, right? And to us, we would never think, I'd rather have Roblox than the real dollar, right? He, much, he doesn't care about the real dollar. He's like, what He's am I going to do with this? He's crazy, like, I, I, want, I want my Roblox. Right? And so I think you'll see as time passes, it's just naturally going to transition. That, mm -hmm. that is an NFT, right? Yes. It's a digital collectible, whether you call it, a, whether it's a shirt or a card or whatever. And I think as that happens, you know, the, the economy will shift. And I think the two people that have it right now are Roblox and, um, and Fortnite and uh, Minecraft. I think the three of them have a huge leap head. And I don't think people realize that's what they are. They're an NFT company. Yeah, it has been really amazing to watch the growth of those three platforms, actually. The kind of skins that people buy, like, say, the Roblox, Robux, um, concert tickets to, um, you know, see Travis Scott or Ariana Grande within the game, you know, just the way that they're, it, they're running their business is real kind of setting the, setting the bar for how things should be. Um, you guys have any, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, from a, well, in collectibles, right, like, it, even from, from a film perspective, in the good old days, you know, you'd have your... VHS collection or oh, DVD yes. collection. I'm, that's you know I've, I was more of a DVD guy, but uh, grew grew up in the you know VHS era and and so but you owned those. Mm. They were in your house and you could loan them to people and and so how does that model transition into digital? 
and proving that you own something. So if you buy a movie and you stamp that on chain forever, mm -hmm. it says, I own this. Yes. And then you can do things with that, potentially loan that out to somebody, sell it to somebody else. And then inside the smart contract, not only if you, know, you buy a movie for $20, does everybody get paid immediately. Mm -hmm. Now you own it, you can prove it forever. No single company can take that away from you. Yes. Just like when they you know, put a show out on Netflix and you get invested in it and then they're like, just kidding. You know, like take your show away. And yeah. they can just yes. do that anytime they want. And so for you to be you know, building a collection of these things, it's, it's proving that you own it, it's getting everybody paid immediately and you have control over what you can do with that collectible. Yeah. You want to sell it to somebody else? If you do sell it to somebody else, there's resale royalties in there. So the original publisher can get paid instead of going back to like the movie trading company and selling it for $2 and, you know, trying to get rid of your old DVDs and, you know, <laughs> yeah. they get, and then, you know, so it's like it, there's so many efficiencies that are gained in there and benefits to the consumers and the studios. And so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of creators getting paid more and, you know, the, the removing the middlemen out of the picture, it's yes. like, it's the direct connection of the fan to the creator and then you own it. You can do whatever you want with it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it is about creators being able to monetize their work directly and kind of reduce those power imbalances, I think, that have traditionally existed in the past. So it's, um, yeah, setting a new standard and hopefully we're going to see oh, a, yeah. lot, a lot more of this. We're, um, we're, we're lulled right now into not owning anything. Yeah. We, everybody, there's, you don't own your music, you don't own your TV, you don't like, you don't own your apartment, like you, like we are getting lulled into that. Yes. And so this, this whole technology, this movement is an opportunity to take that back. Yeah, and completely reshift Ownership. and recalibrate. Yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why do you think, um, why specifically are low fees required for NFTs to be adopted? L why are <clears throat> low fees, you said? Mm -hmm. Well, so I think right now you got a bigger problem than just low fees. I mean, people always talk about gasoline in, mm -hmm. you know, crypto or NFTs and the cost of gasoline. So that was kind of like why, why this particular crypto went up or that one, because the NFT sits on a, a, a more or less expensive, you know, gas, which is, yeah. I guess, just another term for the cost of the platform. Right now, I think the bigger issue, again, is just the word NFT, mm -hmm. gas or no gas, it, it's just not selling because of kind of this oversaturation of BS NFTs. I think it will come back, but I actually think the word NFT won't. Um, yeah. I think the concept of NFT, like I said, it's already there. So we just finished shooting this movie called Skill House. And instead of going out and saying, we're selling you an NFT, um, we created a sweatshirt with a little chip in it that uh, 50 cents, one of the stars, and this, this uh, uh, influencer called Bryce Hall is another one of the stars. And it's a limited edition drop. They put it on their social, and it has a chip, and you scan it onto your phone. And every time you, you get, every time there's new content, only you get it, meaning you who have bought that sweatshirt. Yeah. And it's loaded, it comes onto the chip, and goes on your phone. It also becomes your movie ticket in the future, or your pay-per-view ticket. And it also gives you access to like, hey, win a lunch with 50 Cent, win, win a chance to come to the premiere. All of those things are basically an NFT. Mm. But we're not calling it an NFT, we're giving them a physical good by sending a sweatshirt with a chip. Theoretically, they could just buy the NFT and have a virtual and never have anything physical and get the same thing. But the moment you call it an NFT because of what's happened, you yes. kind of, none of the talent will promote it. You know, a 50 Cent or a, a Bryce Hall, all the agents, managers, they're like, run from this, don't walk because of what's been happening with securities regulations. So I think you're gonna see a lot of the idea of NFTs, but I don't think it's gonna be called NFT. Yeah, you're right. There is such a stigma attached to the, the you know, NFT. You say it, you see people eye roll, or there's a bit of an audible groan. I think unless you're kind of in that industry, in that world, you understand the benefit of it. But if you're kind of on the outskirts and maybe don't understand as much the benefits and the potential of it, you just think, well, that's just a load of nonsense. It's funny because I, <laughs> when I, I literally called, had to call 50 or anytime we do any kind of, you know, different promotion or different drop outside of the movie, we need the talent approval. So I called 50 and I said, we're gonna do this thing with a sweatshirt with this NFC. And he got his, he let me get my manager on the phone. He's like, we're not doing anything with <laughs> excuse me, effing <laughs> NFTs. I was like, no, 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 NFC, NFC. It's a chip, it goes in there. And they're like, oh, oh okay. Um, but that's how, like, like because, t you know, they're trying to take down talent mm. who helped to promote NFCs that turned out to be less than kosher.
Yeah, so that's a really great example of using um, NFT to represent assets, you know, it can represent tickets, sales, um, entry into the theatre, you know, just unique content that could be given to you because you've invested in that NFT. So what are some of the other benefits that you'd say that you'd identify with, with kind of using NFTs or having an NFTs represent these assets? Well, I mean, it, it can represent multiple things at the mm -hmm. same time. So uh, if you have 10 movies that you bought, from, from a studio. Now, now Disney knows that you own those 10 movies because they can see it in your wallet. So when you go to Disney World and you show them what's in your wallet, they're like, you're a super fan. I already know, here's the fast pass. Yeah. You know, here's some Disney bucks. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually, that's where I, I disagree a bit. Okay. I think the studios are gonna fight it tooth and nail. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't think you'll ever have a Disney <laughs> adopting it because it, the very concept of decentralizing you know, a, anything. Um, there's five studios and, and they have these gates that they put up, physical and digital. And they basically say, we have this secret sauce that nobody else can touch. <laughs> that's why we make all these great movies and TV shows. And we're as consumers, we're sitting here saying, where's all the great movies and TV shows? They're all shit. But really, they're like, we have the secret sauce, right? And you have to go through their portal. They learn the hard way by giving Netflix the power and then going, oh my God, how do we take it back quickly? And so anything that takes the power out of their hands and the control out of their hands scares them. Mm -hmm. So I actually think as much as the theaters will adopt it and the guilds and unions will adopt it, there's going to become a, a, soon a war, just like we're seeing right now with the WGA, where the unions, the, the, the WGA, SAG, all the people that represent the talent, um, the agents are going to be pushing for what all, they're not going to call it, you know, an, NF, uh, an NFT. They're going to call it a transparency financial system, mm -hmm. which is just blockchain, and the studios are going to fight it tooth and nail, say, no, 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 we got to keep it how it is. And yeah. it will eventually move this direction because the unions control the talent, um, yeah. but it will take time. And do you think based on that, then it's more likely that you'll see kind of lesser known filmmakers and content creators adopt this rather than the, the kind of big key players, yeah, because the, yeah. the benefits to them are, are a lot bigger. So I think it's kind of the first mover again, like when I'll bring up Netflix again. You know, when we did Netflix, everybody's like, it's, you did it, instead of going to HBO or Showtime, you went with this company, Netflix. I mean, it was a billion dollar market cap. They were the guys who were doing mail order DVDs. And it wasn't, that was in 2010. In 2014 is the next studio they got, which was DreamWorks. Yeah. Um, and that whole period of time, people were like, what do you, why would you ever do this digital distribution? Um, and I think that the same thing will happen here. A couple studios will start adopting it. Mm -hmm. They'll realize it's much better for the talent, which means if the talent's happier, they're happier, even though they can't play like, the accounting tricks studios do. And then when they realize also it cuts out a lot of the friction points of, and, and basically a lot of the cost of middlemen. So you, right now you have collection agents and lawyers and accounting firms and auditors. That's gone. So once they realize, ooh, we're not going to lose all the power and someone else goes first, and the unions are pushing on them, I think then you'll see kind of the whole industry move to this kind of more fluid model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So off the back of that and what we were talking about, you know, the kind of the big players being like, no, no, we're going to keep it in kind of the traditional way. How would you address the skepticism, um, you know, by fans and content creators alike, that the ownership model will ever, ever gain adoption because the traditional model is so ingrained and there's so much investment in it? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we've been striving to build um, mm. at RAD is, you know, we always saw the, the creators as coming first in this. We've been having these convos with the, the studios since 2017 and, you know, are inching our way, I guess, closer to some of those deals. But to Ryan's point, um, those are going to take a long time. Uh, on the creator side of things, I think what's been missing, um, specifically from the video standpoint, is just... Uh, an easy way to do it all. You know, a lot of people come in and they say, like, oh, I have to make a wallet, I have to do this, I have to do that, I'll just go upload it to YouTube and be yeah. done. Yes. Um, so that's what we're building at RAD, and not only having apps on, like, PlayStation and, you know, smart TV, stuff like that, to give them good distribution, um, but allow them to use these tools in a very simple and uh, clean flow. Yeah. And I think a really good example of that is, so the project we were just talking about that we just finished, Skillhouse, like, we self-financed it, we self-produced it. We purposely don't have a studio involved. And the reason is we want to use it as a template to yeah. see what happens when you don't have a studio and if you do use the digital assets available. So we're going direct to theater and just using digital as opposed to having a studio. We're working directly with Rad, which is why we're here, to where you buy that sweatshirt we talked about with the chip. Mm -hmm. 
and your, your, your pay-per-view or your PVOD, if you want to call it that, is, is embedded. So when you bought the sweatshirt, you already paid for your cost of the pay-per-view. So as soon as it's available, it'll pop up on your phone, scan it, and it'll say, go to Rad and put this code in, and you've already bought the movie. Um, so we'll be the first, I think, not I think I know, to do it. Um, and I th I'm not sure if it will be the catalyst of it yet, but it certainly will, I think, open people's eyes to, wow, that, that works. And yes. it can work, like, and that's, again, the problem. It also shows the studios, they're not needed anymore. They're just banks now. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I think there's all these ideas, and I think big studios or small studios want to take the plunge, but there's that inherent fear. So you guys doing this, it's the test bed. Mm. I don't doubt for a second that it's not going to be successful. You know, it's going to yeah. be amazing. And hopefully the bar will be raised and people will follow suit, and this is what's going to generate that change. Well, if you think so, for us, 50 Cent, who has 50 million social media followers, Bryce Hall gets 180 million views every time he posts a snap, which is more than the Super Bowl. So if he posts and says, guys, buy this shirt, which also is your movie ticket, which also is your content, he has like about somewhere, he has a 70% engagement rate. So even if three, four percent of his audience buys, you're selling five times the tickets a studio sells by putting $50 million of P&A into it. Mm -hmm. And so once that happens, I really think you're going to see a freak out by the studios of like, how do we get into this so we don't get completely cut out? Yeah, yeah. All right, I appreciate we are nearly out of time, so I'm going to have three questions each for you. Kind of, can okay. <laughs> answer quickly and succinctly. Um, it's <laughs> so very Brooklyn. difficult for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, don't worry. Uh, Brooklyn, I'm going to ask you first. Um, what future is Rad NFTV building towards? Uh, like I mentioned before, we're really just trying to be that on-ramp um, for creators and, and the fast movers working with, with people like Ryan, um, ultimately making everything easier and, and more efficient um, from start to finish. Yes, yes. Brilliant uh, to hear that from you. Um, Tony, what will it take for mass adoption of these technologies from creators? Uh, um, I mean, simplifying the interface, mm. losing a lot of the language around kind of what Ryan was saying is important. Um, it has to be fast, easy, cheap to use. That's, that's why we gravitated towards BSV. Yes, yes. And, um, yeah, so I mean, I think it's, it's uh, multiple layers of things, but you know, the beha if, when you tell a creator that they'll get paid immediately, they get yeah. excited about Their it. Their eyes open yeah. up and yeah. they begin to listen. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Ryan, how long until we see someone like yourself using blockchain, smart contracts, and NFTs throughout the entire um, process of making a film? So I, I actually launched the very first security token in 2017 oh. that was actually meant for that very thing from the financing through the to paying all of the ecosystem to the distribution. Yeah. And unfortunately, the, the first movie we were going to do that with was actually the last saw. But then the pandemic happened. So it all got pulled. Um, so we kind of rejiggered our whole process. And that's the first one's coming out at Skillhouse with them. It'll be out. I think it's the last week of February and we'll we'll see how it goes. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to that. Honestly, guys, thank you so much. Brilliant conversation. We've run out of time. I think it's something we could have carried on talking about for a while, but you got to go. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, give it up for my fantastic panellists. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.